I'm Professor of Dress History and Curatorship at London College of Fashion, and I'm Joint Director with Judith Clark of the Centre for Fashion Curation. I've invited EJ Scott to come and talk to me because I'm fascinated about how he collected for the Museum of Transology. Um, EJ, could you introduce yourself, please? Hello everyone, thanks for having me, Amy. It's an honour, of course. Um, I'm EJ and I'm a curator, but I'm also a member of the LGBTIQ plus community. And so my passion for representation in the past for my community that I'm a member of um, also now informs the work and the curation I do. And so as part of this, uh, I, I started a project going on nearly 10 years ago now, believe it or not, called the Museum of Transology. So that's what we're here to talk about today. Yes, um, EJ and I met maybe, maybe, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago. But what unites us is that we are both students of Professor Lou Taylor. Um, me in the early 1980s, EJ considerably later. Um, I only because I went back when I was older. <laughs> um, we're amongst the many, many students who she totally inspired me for the first time in my educational life um, to go on and pursue dress history and its various manifestations. And one of the projects I did a, a long time ago, 15 or more years ago, was um, work with Valerie Mendes documenting the Worth Archive at the V&A. And for his study with Lou, EJ had discovered an extraordinary archive. And so we invited EJ to write a contribution to that book. Um, so that's that's how we've met and interfaced and both live in the Brighton area. Um, yeah. And I think as well, Amy, that 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 inspiration with Lou as well, I still see connections in in how we both approach material culture. You know, that's absolutely the foundation of everything that I was taught under Lou. She she really shaped how I approach collecting and the study of objects fundamentally. So so I it's it's so nice to just mention her name and give give her that credit because she just was a complete and utter inspiration to all the work I've ever done since. Yeah, me too. And also I think maybe the very human side of the work, that a lot of our work is 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 not focusing upon aesthetics. I think we appreciate the aesthetics and certainly I you know we're fascinated by design, but it's the human condition in many respects and human lives lived that I think motivate much of our work. And with that in mind, I specifically wanted to ask you about collecting um, for the Museum of Transology, because the subject in itself is fascinating and it was a new area of collecting. But I was also fascinated by the way you collect, the fact that you use crowdsourcing and digital sourcing, and you've also gone on to look at um, equity and inclusivity in terms of collecting. And I'd just be fascinated if you could tell me some more about that, please. Well, I, I think it comes down to these these principles of why someone collects, you know, anyone who's studied Russell Belk or Susan Pierce and, and is has this 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 theoretical knowledge of how collections can talk on behalf of the collector, how they can represent communities. It was it was my my understanding of collecting as as a uh, a powerful form of documentation, but also a medium then from which you could draw to display people's lives. Um, it's a, the, you know, the objects being these conduits to to expose the reality um, of, of people's lives and, and, and talking on behalf of them. That was central to me to as 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 a medium, if you like, um, to navigate how we could tackle the misrepresentation of trans people in society. They're, they're um, a, a, a chronically misrepresented group, you know, within the media, within politics, within the medical field. So it felt to me like there was a way of using my medium to help tackle the social injustices that surrounded this community. And, and specifically, it was it was the opportunity for these peoples to be the curators of their own stories by actually choosing which object they wanted to donate to the collection. There was, it was giving them back autonomy 
over the nature that surrounded them. And so that to me was very, very important in, in using collection as almost as a form of activism, you know, almost as a as sort of a continuation of the lineage of, you know, the spirit of LGBT pride, right? You know, that has been the protests, has been the marches. This seemed to me to, to segue as a methodology into that field of activism, standing up for people's rights through this process of collecting because it enabled people to communicate their own realities um, because they were in charge of that story that they were going to tell. Oh, so the project um, was originally commissioned, wasn't it, by London College of Fashion by Ligaya Salazar, and the exhibition was staged at the London College of Fashion, and it then moved to Brighton Museum, where I think it's been for two, three or more years? Yeah, that's right. So, so it started as a, a, a tiny little community project. Um, I've got a couple of, of photos, actually, Amy. Shall I show you? some of the original photos shall I screen share with you and give you okay so this photo here is an interesting one if you can see that there on your screen in the middle of your screen this cabinet here I saved up for and saved up for and saved up for this glass cabinet here and it all folds down and it goes into a flight case like a big record DJ flight case and folds down and you can take it around areas and you might just be able to see on the top of it it says Museum of Transology and I got those those letters cut out of a leftover piece of of plastic and glued them with super glue onto the front of them and and asked members of the local community to come along and donate an object that they felt talked about their experience their gender experiences and with with this grew a collection that eventually turned into a massive collection and this is this is at the Marlborough pub this one here um, which is the community pub in Brighton where the collection started it's a queer community pub and people came along and I think this is a really important point to make they came along to a space that they thought was safe right from the start it was on their terms we were collecting in their environment in a space that they felt comfortable to bring their objects to in front of people that they would explain their objects to first of all who were members of their community so it wasn't asking them to come along to the big scary museum that they'd been locked out of for so long it was asking them to come along to their community to talk and share with their community and eventually the the collection grew in this pub to so many objects that we had to end up trying to work out a system of cataloging them. So what you're seeing here are photographs of them all sitting on, on the pub tables where we would go through and take photos of them and try and keep a record of them. And this is back in the day and it just grew and grew and grew in momentum until now we've, it's now the largest collection of material culture relating to trans lives anywhere in the world. And EJ, could I just interrupt you? Is yeah. it possible to make your image full screen? So it's just that I can see your your screensaver as well. That's it. Perfect. Thank you. So so it's it it grew and it grew and it grew until now we've got basically four hundred or more four hundred odd objects in the collection. Um, it it presented a whole lot of uh, you know no one really predicted that it would grow so big so fast necessarily and if i just take you over here uh to this one amy um here we can see this is the museum of transology's website and if we go over to the exhibitions we can see the fashion space gallery exhibition but there's also an excellent this is online. This is the Museum of Transology with Arts and Culture um, on Google. And Google came into the Fashion Space Gallery and they documented the exhibition for us. And then they transcribed the, the text panels alongside it as well. So this gives you a really good virtual view of what it looked like when it was at the, the uh, when Legaya commissioned it at the Fashion Space Gallery. Um, and shows you how it grew from what was um, a community collection in community spaces for the community. And it really did have an impact on the community by doing that the community, their trust grew in the project, if you like, um, and, and they were inspired then to trust us 
to to enable us to collect online. So we posted messages using social media um, and we did a little Facebook page basically on Facebook and we put out a call for objects um, to, to grow the collection to eventually be put into this formal space. So there was a shift in the formality of the collection moving out of what was a community space and a community project. And we started collecting again for the London College of Fashion exhibition, essentially. Um, and through that process of, of collecting for the London College of Fashion Fashion Space Gallery exhibition, that's when the documentation of the objects became serious and where we started compiling um, a collections database and a system, you know, creating our own system of, of managing the collection and formalizing how it would come together um, with, with, with traceability, if you like, where to look for the object and how to manage who had donated the provenance of it. And it grew to the point now where when, so you can see it, and the lovely photos that we've got on the website um, as well on the Museum of Transology. But then you can also go over and you can look at the collections themselves and how we've broken them down. And these the these categories that we have with the collections are literally taken from the way that we use the floor space in the, the fashion space gallery to uh, basically group the collections together. Because one of the things that's quite difficult about this process of collecting where the, 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 the contributors are actually really the curators. One of the things about doing it that way is that you don't end up with a collection that's like putting on a house of worth exhibition at the VNA, right, if only, but you don't end up with this, this collection that necessarily the objects provide you with a linear map that you put on show. You're putting on show a collection of objects that really are very, very different from each other. And when you have a look here, you can have, you know, you can see what I mean. You know, you've got everything from badges to ballet slippers to swimming goggles to soft toys to literature to, to costume. And it was very it was really important to me. It was what I had hoped for, but it was um, um, really interesting to see that costume, fashion, accessories, fashionable accessories, of course, turned out to be a good 40%, 50% of the collection overall. People were using fashionable objects to explain their experiences, but also because the exhibition was very much about gender identity. Of course, people were going to use fashionable objects from their wardrobes to, to uh, you know, as, as their choice, if you like, um, as, as the objects that they felt were most important that talked about them. So there's everything from underwear, which is something that we see in all collections. You know, the VNA did the fantastic underwear collection there. Um, people, particularly women, have shaped their silhouettes um, for centuries, right? So this isn't something new and peculiar to the trans community. The fact that they use garments to shape their, 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 their fashionable silhouette as well, their desired silhouette. There was also political t-shirts played a really big big role in 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 the exhibition and in the collection at large and that's interesting to me as well because when you look at the vna's collections there's in the fashion collection there there's a um a, a 2000 a t-shirt that was given to the collection from 2000 that's a nike t-shirt but it's been written to say instead dikey with the nike swoosh underneath and it says um dikey just do her but it's from 2000 so it's 20 years before the production of these t-shirts and i think that's a really nice material marker for the fact that the trans movement is 20 years behind the lesbian and gay movement and it was very very fashionable in the 1990s to wear um, uh, to wear T-shirts that that said, you know, gay and proud. Everyone will probably remember the 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 the, the um, T-shirts that said um, "Silence equals death" by the ACT UP 
community. So we've got these 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 sort of fashionable markers of of identity, people being brave enough to be out in the lesbian and gay community in the 1980s and 1990s, and those collections actually being reflected in in the V&A. Now we have them reflected in the Museum of Transology as as a timely reminder of just how far there is to go on this journey. Um, it's really quite interesting to be able to, to to have those material markers because I guess that's for me was the motivation for, for putting together the collection in the first place because actually um, what we were seeing is this huge spike in visibility of trans people within the media um, and 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 particularly debated with the with the within Parliament, for example, and online, um, what's what was difficult was even though we were seeing this huge social awareness being writ large um, within the broader community about trans people, the people who didn't have a voice to do it were the trans people themselves, and that's really interesting to me because, in actual fact, what what we were seeing happening with this spike in visibility with the trans community was that if we were going to look back in a hundred years time about what was happening to them, um, uh, what we were going to be left with was the same documentation that we look back and use to, to look back on gay men's lives from a hundred years ago. You use medical records, you use records of incarceration, you use newspaper articles. It's very, very rare that you find a precious piece within um, gay male history that is actually love letters, for example, collections that people have saved about themselves. They're more archival evidence rather than, than collections per se, because of course, gay men were in the closet. They had to hide. And it, it, and it, it took you as a private individual and a private collector to form this collection. And as a private collector, you didn't have any of the burden or or the benefits of the institution and so you were free to collect as you saw fit um mm. and you could set your own criteria y yes and no amy so yes absolutely i wrote the collecting policy which was to enable which actually was that there wouldn't be a collecting policy as we know it today and would recognize within an institution i could make the collection as big as i wanted it to right i could accept all the objects it gave me the freedom to accept objects that a museum wouldn't accept and and the objects that the museum wouldn't accept they wouldn't put a handbag in like this with machine main lace that doesn't have a high design value according to an institution that collects the very best in art and design, for example. Um, so there was freedom on that, absolutely. Yeah. And it was only me who was going to do that, Amy. Yeah. However, I think one of the challenges of doing collection like this is the emotional burden the responsibility that I didn't know that this, this collection was going to be saved. It was living in my house. It was laden with emotional trauma as well. So when it was coming and arriving on my doorstep, I was scared to open the packages. And I went through this collecting process for about two years and it was really, really triggering. You know, there's objects in here that, that, that have come with a huge emotional toll, you know, and, and one of the objects in particular, this one here from, from Chrissy, you know, she took her own life um, in the process of building this collection. So, and there's objects of self-harm, there's objects that represent violence. So there were there were objects in the collection as well, what what that were coming in to my home and my my emotional hemisphere that I didn't have any institutional protection buffering me from, right? And as well, so there's the emotional burden, but then there's also the burden of space and conservation. 
How do you care for these collections? Look at how diverse the materials are that are in the collection. There's human remains, you know, there's, there's, there's clothing, material like textiles, there's paper, there's, there's makeup, there's silicon. So it's a really, really complex collection to care for. How do you do that properly when you don't have the institutional support yeah. to do it? Um, so I think that there's really big, um, there's, there's issues that people need to be aware of when you try and act on behalf as a saviour for your community, for example, right, and you take on that role. Actually, you need to ask yourself whether you're equipped to do that or yeah. not. Um, like they were saying that lots of these objects, I mean, obviously the objects that are um, hormones and things like that have a clear link, but a seemingly prosaic object like a My Little Pony, yep. like a bag with machine made lace. Yep. I think this is what really excites us about objects, isn't it? It's, it's, it's the symbolism, it's that object as a holder and evidence of a life lived that transfers it from something every day to something really deeply moving and extraordinary. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the, there's there's objects in here that take your breath away and yet they're everyday objects, um, you know, and, and I think actually it's very important, Amy, that they're everyday objects. My, my theory about what happens with everyday objects, um, particularly when they're put into a museum environment, um, when it comes to sensitive histories and fraught histories like trans history, is that what they do, the magic of them, is that you're looking at them behind glass. The glass has been cleaned that morning by, by the conservationists in the, in the museum and it's sparkling. You can see your own reflection on the glass when you're looking at the object. And then you look through your own reflection to the object and you recognize the object um, and, and I'm going to give you an example. You recognize the object as something that you too might have. And it's this one here that I think is a really nice example. This is a lipstick. She says this lipstick was from my wonderful sister who was the first family member to accept and support my transition. What I find particularly interesting about it is the lipstick is not Yves Saint Laurent, you know, it's not Chanel. It's it's a lipstick that's come from Boots or from Sully's, right? It's cost a couple of quid. It's a lipstick that everyone could have in their handbag and they recognize it. They also recognize that the lipstick's battered, you know, it's been kicking around in her handbag for too long. She's been meaning to get it out. She's forgotten. Eventually it's melted a little bit down the bottom. This is an experience that everyone can relate to. You've got someone in your life who's who's got a cheap lipstick like this. That's just their everyday slap, you know. And what happens is you you come along to the museum, you look at yourself looking at this object in the glass, and for that split moment, because it's an everyday object that you recognise, you go. I've got an object like that, or I know what that object is. And for that split second, you have not had time to discriminate against trans people. You've seen yourself, haven't you? You've seen yourself. Yeah, and, and, and it's interrupted discrimination, Amy, right? It's interrupted your ability to go, trans people are weird and they're different from me, because now you've got something in common with them. Right. So actually, it's these everyday objects that are, are such a, a valuable, invaluable tool to understanding why it is. You know, this is a great one as well. How how to talk, how to use the museum environment and these objects and collecting as as a unique medium to interrupt misconceptions about communities that are beyond your usual framework, right? And it's the responsibility of the curator, the responsibility of the curator to, I mean, not only to collect, but how we interpret and how we tell the stories and how we display and communicate is a big responsibility, especially in instances where we are dealing with, as you say, yeah marginalised communities. Yeah, and it, and it kept me awake at night. I mean, it was a very diff, 
deliberate curatorial strategy to not only collect the object, what I was collecting was the story, right? And so people would contact me and send me an, an email or a Facebook message and they'd say, I want to be part of it. Can I please do it? What have I got to do? And I would have to get one of these tags and I would have to go to the post office and I'd have to pop an envelope in the mail that had stamps already affixed on onto it so that they because this this community um, suffers very high levels of unemployability unemployment because of discrimination amongst employers um, and so they, they often live in poverty so I couldn't expect them to be able to pay to deliver the object to me so I'd have to ask them what their object is make an estimate of how much postage to put on it I'd go up I'd send them a self you know, an already previously stamped envelope, and I'd send them one of these in there, and I'd ask them to write their story onto it. And so there's another element here. I was collecting their story, but I was collecting their story with the intention of, of it being clear visually that they authored it, that it was done on their terms. Right? And that's that's why I've used not just, so I have transcribed them to make them more accessible down the bottom. And when I put them on display, I've, I've, also, I've also, so if we go to exhibitions and go to the Brighton Museum exhibition, you can see around the edge of, of the display, they do come with, with the text transcribed so it's easier to read and more accessible. But in all, all, the, all cases, I've kept the tags and I've attached them to the objects and put them on display with the objects because that's, that's really what's on display here. It's real people's voices talking through the objects that they're attached to. Um, so it, it was it was very important to me that that that's that's what happened. But it it brings me on to sharing with you our most recent project, which has been actually I'll show you here, which is which has been understanding actually that this process of crowdsourcing objects, whilst it is democratic to a certain extent. We do have to recognise the limitations of it are the same limitations that apply to, in a way, to museums as well, because whilst it was very important to the collecting process to build the trust with the community by doing it in their own space first. You can't ask marginalised communities to be invited into museums and think that they're just going to do it straight off their own back and feel safe to do it just because you're asking them to. You can't expect them to do that emotional labour. In many instances, you actually have to take the museum to them. You have to engage with them. And obviously, you know, most museums don't have the resources or the energy or even necessarily the, the community standing to necessarily be able to go into these spaces. But by going to, to the community and collecting within those spaces first, we built trust in in the process and in the project um, by 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 them them knowing that there was a trans person that was part of the process as well and then we could expand it and it grew exponentially and then we could put on exhibitions like the one at Brighton Museum for, that was on there for three odd years but what I did realize was that there was when I've looked back and reflected on it is actually we we were attracting people who felt safe with engaging with the process of collecting and the Western notion of collecting and saving objects for posterity. This is this is a, a, a Western way of thinking in many ways, and that's been pointed out to me. And what I realized was that actually we had overrepresentation of people who were familiar with the process of collecting, and that that overrepresentation by and large meant white people and that actually when when you come and you have a look at this idea of using the tags to write your stories on when we did have members from the cutie pop community which stands for queer trans intersex black indigenous people of color when we did have members of the cutie pop community um, contributing to the collection which we did very because we proactively collected from that community so you can see these collections here um, what was happening was they were writing about a single linear experience. They were writing about their transness. They weren't writing about intersectional experiences of how their transness and their ethnicity 
collided because these and here we've made a point of of sourcing a quote on intersectional experiences it it didn't provide the space the little tags didn't provide the space for more complicated stories but also the fact that i'd asked for people to contribute to what i'd call the museum of transology i'd made it about trans experiences singular and so what we have had to do I felt was go back and revisit our collecting strategy and actually deliberately collect stories from this community that allowed them to talk in greater depth. So we've made a series of videos and we've done it in a very, I hate this photo, but that's life. We've, we've done it in a very simple way where we've recorded on Zoom. So we haven't had to ask for a video maker to be involved. We haven't had the budget. None of this has been done with any budget whatsoever. The budget that went into to paying for the stamps on the envelopes was all my personal donation and commitment to the project. This has all been done beyond the institution without any financial support. We haven't even got any, we haven't even applied for support from Heritage Lottery Fund or the Arts Council. That's, that's a future consideration. But what we did to make sure it was really, really inexpensive and, and that the labour was low was we just recorded a conversation uh, with members from the Cutie Pop community talking about objects that were important to them and explaining the importance of that object and why there needed to be a Cutie Pop specific, specific collection of the muse in the Museum of Transology to represent these lives. So we've opened up, you can see here, we've opened up the process of collecting again and built a QDB pop collecting donation form specifically for the project and enabled people to submit online. So it avoids the process of having to go to the post office and do all that physical stuff. And then once we receive this, we organize to make the film with them. And then we do this video documentation for them. So what we've started to do now is recognize that there's different methods of collecting for this project that need to be enacted, that, that we need to recognise that not all curatorial and collecting strategies work for all sections of, this, of, of our community, and that in order to ensure that there is a broad representation of multiple identities, we can't just go for a singular collecting and curatorial linear narrative. We have to expand that to include collecting digital stories where people can talk um, about the objects that are important to them. Interestingly, what's actually happened is people have then gone to the post office themselves and felt so passionate about contributing their object after we've made these films that they've sent them to us and we've now built a material culture collection as well with these new objects. Can I, can so, I to share any of these films with us, EJ? I mean, yeah. Them, even just for a few minutes? Sure, sure. Why not? I'm just my volume's really low. You might have written back. Okay, in. Hi everyone, I'm EJ and I'm the curator of the Museum of Transology. And I'm really passionate about ensuring that we're written back into history and that we save and preserve our ancestry. But I'm equally as concerned that we don't, in this attempt to halt the erasure of ancestry make the same mistakes in collecting history that wrote us out in the first place. And by that, I mean that I think it's incredibly important that we proactively collect from those of us who are marginalised within our marginalised community. And so without further ado, I'll tell you my pronouns. It's he, they, or you can just use my name. And I'm going to say hello to our new friend and the latest contributor to the Museum of Transology Collection. It's Kaiden. Hi. Hi, Kaiden. Tell us your your pronoun to start off with, and what maybe where you are where you are today. Uh, my pronouns are him and he, uh, and I'm in Tottenham today in London, and, and every other day. And every other day. And and tell me, you have decided to take part in the Museum of Transology. Why do you think it's important that we have a Museum of Transology? I think. It, it's really important to remember that um, like there's so, there's so much debate 
about us in the public and there's so much like jargon that just gets thrown around I think it's it's really important to remember that every trans person is a person and has their own individual life and their story and it's not just like a statistic or um this like nameless faceless community that can just be referred to um I think it's really important to like cherish the individuality of every single person it's amazing and you're going to contribute to what we call the QDB pop collection, so queer, trans, intersex, black, indigenous, people of colour, to the collection that we're building specifically for these communities to ensure that they are included in, in our ancestry. Why do you think it's important to have a collection that represents like this? Um, because we don't, well, we don't have as much representation. Um, I certainly found throughout my entire transition that it's it's so much more difficult to find resources um, for people who look like me or who you know have have the same experiences um, and it can be really difficult to navigate things like healthcare and um, well yeah healthcare resources um, experiences it's difficult to feel connected to people if there's an extra if there's an extra barrier um, of, of not being able to like relate in the same way to the people around you and I think it's it's really important to have um, a collection where you can walk in and see like oh these are all of the these are all of the people like me who came before me and who are existing now and who will exist in the future and you can remember that you're connected to something yeah and I think I think that's really the power of understanding that our ancestry is there before us, it's coming ahead of us and it's happening now as well. Yeah. Yeah. It was so beautifully put, thank you. Tell us about your object that you want to contribute to the collection. So, so my object, to you. my object is uh, it's a, a rock. This is one of three that I have. Um, it was taken from Torquay Beach last year uh, and I I went there for my top surgery and it was the last day of my like recovery stay um and I, I me and my boyfriend who'd been looking after me we just sort of went for a walk down to the seafront because I felt up to it um and ever since I was a child I've had like an obsession with picking up rocks from beaches um it started off as like interesting or really beautiful rocks that I saw but then it just got to a point where like every like my parents went out on a lot of caravan holidays um, <laughs> big fan of like canvas sands in great yarmouth so every time we went to a caravan holiday i'd come back with just bags of rocks <laughs> and it got really excessive to the point where i had i think it was two shoe boxes and then one big bag just full of rocks and stones in my bedroom Did you have like when i was growing up no i have i have some of them and they're back in my my parents house um i sort of save like my my personal favorites uh but i kind of wish that i'd kept all of them just to just be a crazy rock person you know? yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> this one this one um like I, when we went for our walk i was like okay i want to i want to i want to find a rock i want to get that that um that thing back going again and there were really nice like pink rocks all over the beach because of the red cliffs of Devon um so I'd said I was just going to pick one and then obviously I, I couldn't like bend down and get them or anything so my boyfriend was I was pointing at them and he was picking them up for me and I was looking at them um so by, by the time we've got to the end of the beach I think he had like five different rocks in his his sands and I, I it took some convincing for me not to just take all of them back um <laughs> I was having so much trouble picking between them but in the end I think I, I got this one I got another one that was a little bit bigger one that was a little bit smaller and a tiny one and it sounds to me like they're a, a real like for you they're this physical marker of something you've done and somewhere you've been and, yeah. yeah yeah and so in this way they mark a point in time so for you and your transness it, it marks this point of time when you're in recovery you've, mm -hmm. you've you've reached a gender milestone is that fair to say yeah yeah absolutely um and it's like one of like this particular stone is always going to hold that memory for me as well like the other ones are just 
they could be from anywhere because I had so many of them when I was younger that they're just they're just a reminder of like caravan holidays and uh, you know be, being with my family and you know, being at the beach. But this these ones are a specific memory and like the the journey that it took me to to get there and to get to my surgery and um, it, even like a year on the the work that it took to recover and like take care of myself afterwards. So it's not it's not just a memory of that day, but it's also of the year leading up to it, six years leading up to it and the year following it and like where I am now and um, how happy I am with myself. I was about to say you strike me as being in a really good place. Yeah, yeah well, I've, I've got to say that you you are now a rock of our community. <laughs> you know, and and that, that honestly, I just I'm I'm extremely touched that you've taken part in this. The idea that in the future people can go into the collection and they'll they'll, they'll walk in and they'll be able to say I want to see that rock and that they'll physically be able to touch it yeah. and that they'll be able to connect with your story spiritually through this physical rock. For me, that just that just there, there's so much hope in that story for me. It just feels like our communities are getting stronger and through these objects that people contribute we connect more closely and i think for me that's that's the future and that's why it's so important that you're part of our ancestry and that you're in this collection so thank you so much thank you it's an there you go amy well oh, thank you that was it was fascinating completely fascinating and yet how how one of a million rocks can make such a story and yeah extraordinary thank you you're welcome so i think yeah that that's kind of sums up the project in a, in a nutshell really the way that we try and reach out talk to members of the community allow them to find their own space in the collection and then and and then speak their own truths their own stories through that give them their voice that's that's the most important message i think that that the collection really drives for me. Um, Can I ask you a few questions, EJ, yeah. about um, notions and ideas about collectors generally, and if and how they might relate to you and your collection. And if you don't want to answer, obviously just say pass. Um, there's a, well, first of all, there's a notion that collectors are born, not made. Are you a born collector? Um, I, do you know what I think about that quite often? I. I don't know that I am. I don't think that I, I, I guess it depends on your definition of collector, Amy, because I actually think collecting isn't just saving objects throughout your life that are special to you, which is what I do. I'm definitely a material culturalist. That's absolutely what I am. But I think collectors do more. I think they're devoted to caring and organising and looking after their collections. I think they they have, you can have random collectors that just have masses of things everywhere. Yeah. You know, we all know collectors like that. But I still think there's an intention to, to find objects that come together as a set. So for me, what it was about was understanding collections. That's been a process of me studying curation and studying museum, museology and, and studying studying why and how material culture works. Yeah, uh, what interested me what you said as well was that, um, sorry, I interrupted you, sorry. No, please, um, go. Um, is that one of the definitions of collecting is that it's a strategic act. It is one object in relation to the other. Yes. And as such, yours isn't a strategic act. It's strategic in collecting a category, but it's not one object in relation to another. You wouldn't turn down one packet of Pap's hormone pills because you already had one. But they relate conceptually because yes, one object exactly. is about a trans experience and the other one is about a trans experience. And the way that that works is really interesting because that's exactly what members of the trans community that visit the collection, the, the, the exhibition say. They're like, oh, there's so many of us. Oh, it's so wonderful to feel like I'm part of something. Oh, look at, you know, etc. So they're talking about 
being part of a collective experience. So the objects do fit together like that. However, it certainly was a complete and utter challenge to work out how to display them. <laughs> okay, and before we move on, um, Mika Bell, the um, collections theorist, has argued that the first object is never collected, which it did interest me insofar as I think quite often, you know, someone for, a, I mean, perhaps somebody who's just collecting things aesthetically or to go on a shelf, they might be given, say, a blue and white jug. The blue and white jug isn't the first collected object. It's the next time they walk into a shop and think, oh, that one would go with mine. And so the second object is, in fact, the first collected object. And so do you have an object that is your first collected object? Yes, it's actually it's well, it's in line in line with that theory. And someone else I turn to when I think about this is Jean Bojian, who yes. says that that we collect ourselves. Yes. It's the miracle of collecting. That's absolutely what I've done. I'm a trans person. This is my community. The collection began began, and these these are my first collected objects. Potentially the first collected objects are the ones after that. We could debate that. But what I was building the collection on was when after I had a surgical procedure, I saved every single thing in the hospital. I sweet talked the nurse and she let me take the sheets, the pillowcase, the little cups that had the, the um, um, morphine given in as painkiller, those little paper cups that are all folded over. Um, I, I, I everything. I've got my It's a Boy balloon that my friends brought up to the hospital for me. And I've made this sub collection. And, and I went home with it going, A, what am I going to do with it? This will make a great exhibition. But B, where's it going to go? And what's it? Where's everyone else's stories? And how's about how we don't have anywhere in history for our stories? And yet we've all got this hyper spectacularization in of us in the media around us. And so that's what motivated the collecting process. That's that was the Museum of Transology. Um, I'm interested. I mean, I think that's completely fascinating. And also, I'm interested because it's a Baudrillard quote that has motivated my work, which is that it ought to be obvious that the objects of our daily lives are, in fact, the objects of a passion. And I call all my lectures, irrespective of the subject, objects of a passion. My Instagram, mm -hmm. everything is object of passion. Because it is that thing, it's the objects of our daily lives and the stories we tell. And that is universal. Yeah, it's it's it that that quote about you know when when he's talking about how objects work and systems of objects, that and and collecting that for me, understanding that that we find ourselves within them, that we're actually collecting ourselves. I'd already started the Museum of Transology project when I read that and I was like, oh, <laughs> it's just one of those moments where I'm like, that's it. I've got it. I know what's going on now. <laughs> um, before we finish, EJ, I wondered, um, I know you've, you've, I mean, you've done the Museum of Transology, which is amazing. One of the, res I've got a couple of things I want to ask you, but one of the responsibilities of the collector is there's an attitude that the collector lives as long as the collect the collection lives, as long as the life of the collector lives, when it's a private collection. What are the longer term plans for your so, collection? Yeah, so there were a couple of options. I thought about it very hard when it, uh, when the exhibition closed at the, at Brighton Museum and we opened up Queer the Pier. Um, where was I going to put it? because I'm, I, I was very aware, because again, because of a bit of museum training of, of the importance of conservation values, right? So where was I gonna put it to keep it safe? And also, I mean, it had been on display for four and a half years, right? It had to come off display and be looked after. So it's now in the Bishopsgate Institute in London, in the archive at the Bishopsgate Institute. We did go through a process of thinking about saving it at Brighton Museum and Art Gallery, and it was going through the collections. It was, it was going to be put there. And I had to think very carefully about it because my view was that once it went into the, into the museum and it was accessioned, access to it becomes much more complicated for the community. And, um, and this is no slide on Brighton Museum because what every museum's going through, they, they 
uh, need more funding, they need more staff, they, you know, they don't have enough space, they're, they're deaccessioning at the moment, not accessioning. So how were people going to see it again when it had just been on display for three years? When were they actually going to get access? And my feeling is that the Museum of Transology's job's not over. It's not done. It hasn't stopped talking. It needs to continue to be on display, right? And so the decision to put it at the Bishopsgate Archive came with with some, some agreements in the legal documentation. One of the agreements was that I could tour it whenever I wanted to, that I could loan it to whomever I liked, and that I could allow the public and researchers access to it on the spot without them having to show identification. So normally when you go into an archive, you have to join and be, have a reader's card. And the reader's card is informed with, with, with formal identification that goes onto that card. So it might be your passport or your license. That's a barrier to trans people who don't want to show their identity if it hasn't been legally changed yet. It stops them accessing archives. And so I really wanted to think about the project that the change that the collection could bring could also be institutional change. And the Bishopsgate went away and they talked about this um, at managerial level and they came back and they decided that it was going to be okay for people to access the collection if they said they wanted to. So now a trans person can go in and get that object and say, I want to see Kaiden's stone, I want to see his rock, and it will be brought up for them and put on a desk and they can see it themselves. Can you tell us a bit more about the Bishopsgate Institute then? Why there? And what's the remit of this institution and the resources even that make such an incredible, you know, to make that possible? I mean, I've worked in, you know, national and regional museums. I know with the best one in the world, you know, how if there's one of you, however willing you are to make objects accessible, you know, with the best will in the world, you can't do everything. So why the Bishopsgate Institute? Because it's it's a phenomenal institution. Um, what they're doing is absolutely groundbreaking in every in every way. Um, first of all, they collect uh, that you know they're founded on collections that are working class collections most of the time and everyday people, um, particularly from the, the East End where they're based at Spitalfields because this area with its textile history and the history of factories and poverty. Um, so so their collections very much come from wanting to represent that area. That's how it started. So that's their intention and that's the ethos of the place in the first instance. Um, the second instance is that it's an archive, not a museum. So there are different there's 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 uh, different levels of access that you can get more easily to the objects, um, and even though this is a collection really that could you could say belongs in a museum rather than an archive, the difference being that it was deliberately collected and it's a set of objects, whereas an archive is the random set of objects that's the result of of activities, right? Um, so so it did challenge on that level, but they've decided to be a leading force in the UK for collecting queer histories as well. So they've got the most extraordinary collection of community groups, objects, badges, flyers, newspaper cuttings, T-shirts. They've got everything from the Leatherman's collection, you know, with a motorbike jacket in there, you know, and that it's it's really, really quite extraordinary. That's amazing because um, I, I mean, I was interested to know with relation to you, but um, in the mid 1980s, I was doing my MA at the Royal College of Art and in, in keeping with my interests, it was all about looking at working class dress and the beginning of ready to make wear fashion in the 20s and 30s as opposed to you know, the myth of Chanel and elongated illustrations. And I can remember sitting in the Bishopsgate Institute, I went right through the co-op archive. Looking yeah, that's exactly, that's it. That's, yes. yes, so it's the same place. And so it spoke volumes to me that these were everyday objects that they were going to be accessible. It felt to me like it fit with the ethos of the organization because it was a very big decision i tossed and turned you know of course it's the collection started in brighton yes. so in that way it's part of brighton's history and so it belongs at the brighton museum um however it has grown beyond brighton exponentially and, and london is only an hour or so away on the train it's not 
Yeah, but I've just, I felt there was part of me that felt like a traitor to Brighton Museum because I cut my teeth there. It's offered me as well so much on my journey. I, everything I learned about curation, I did underneath Martin Pell, the fashion curator there, who's still my hero to this day, you know, like I got to mount objects there. He trusted me with everything from object handling through to understanding what a collections database is. So it very much speaks to its community and works with its community as well as representing the community in the local history so I felt a loyalty there you know as well but I just felt that access the Museum of Transology's job's not finished it's not ready to be put away forever. And yeah. was it French to part with it or was it a relief? No it was really emotional <laughs> it was it was really hard it was really, really hard. And that's when I realised how much of myself was invested in it. Um, but it's always, there's, I've always done it as a process that eventually the vision for it is, and, and I've, I've started the process by making online on the Museum of Transology, there's, there's access to the documentation you need to create your own Museum of Transology collection in your own local area. And I've made it completely open source so you can use the logos, you can use the documentation. We've got everything from how to document an object and an accessioning form, uh, 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 condition report, all of these things as uh, how to build your own museum information Amazing. pact, if you like. And so my uh, there's one that's about to start um, potentially in Barnsley. Um, there's a couple that are popping up. I've, I've, I've started talking to a group in China, a group in Japan. So eventually I would imagine that we're going to get to the stage where we have international museum of transologies all around the world. Satellites. That it means that you can, as a trans person as well, you can find your place in history in other cultures as well. You've now got a community to go and visit to see their collection and a reason to get in touch about their collection because you can say you're part of this collection. And in a way, it's it's making collecting is what's at, at the core of, of an international conversation and a strengthening of the community. It's all going to come back to the fact that I belong to this collection, you belong to this collection. We're somehow, you know, spiritually collect, you know, we're all collected together. So we've got something. In the power of objects, isn't it? The absolute power of objects and the ability to tell stories with them. Before we finish, I wonder, would you just say a little bit more about the other work you do? Because I know you've been doing some work at the Tate. Yeah, so I'm the curator of Queer and Now at Tate, and it's again, it's it's a change of a way of working um, for the institution because it's a celebration of queer culture that dives into the collection, but enables and empowers the community to respond to the collection so that they can feel like they can find their voice in art history. Um, whether or not they are actually seeing it there in the labels on the wall. And so when when we did it, it, it came off the back of the Queer British Art Exhibition that was created curated by Claire Barlow. Um, and so it was the festival that was attached around it, essentially. But it's it's grown in its remit because now elements of the 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 event also get archived. So they leave a legacy on the collection as well. And so one of the things that, for example, what we're doing this year in a, in a digital format because of COVID is that there, I've curated a project called Queer Eight Tate instead of Curate Tate, Queer Eight Tate, be a queer eater. And we ran it as an Instagram campaign online. And I invited, the, I think the potential of digital is to be beyond local. Right. If there's one thing it does is it means that you can have a panel that has a guest in Argentina on it. Right. And so we invited 10 grassroots arts collectives around the world, queer art collectives around the world from Istanbul, Argentina, China, all over the shop and asked them to choose a piece from the collection and reinterpret it and some of them even made responses to it. And so we then put those responses on Instagram as a, as a, as a sort of a curated campaign, if you like, with the hashtag Queer and Now, and invited members of the public to do the same. Well, we've, we've, we've just 
printed out a stack of, of reinterpretations of Tate's art. So it's bringing the art alive. It's enabling people to examine their relationship with the collection through their own lens and empowering them to feel like they have a place in history, even if they don't feel like they've been included prior to this. But it's, it brings up all sorts of complex issues. There's the issue that some people use art history and know that the artist was gay and will go back that way. But some people will say, and, and one one particular one is a, is, is a piece that is a piece from Tate Modern that is a photograph of an underground tube station. And they talk about the fact that they used to escape their rural um, um, childhood and come to London and be part of the queer community that weekend and then go back. And this is the train station that they stopped at. So they're rereading the object through their own personal lens. When we ran the campaign, we were exposed to homophobia and transphobia because people can write back and they've got you've got no business saying this is a gay piece of art you've got no business entangling this artist in queer history and they feel quite quite adamant about it um and so there's interestingly the majority of those responses were with fake accounts where people had set them up specifically to troll tate and only had one comment and didn't have any other posts. So they're doing it deliberately and anonymously um, and as not as, you know, someone that's really part of Tate's community. So it's it's not, rep you know, not proportionate, the representation that strategy has. Um, I, do, I do other projects where like, we've just collected 200 oral histories right across West Yorkshire and we've digitized those oral histories and made them we've we've made the audio accessible so by by using a photograph contributed by the person who contributed their oral history and then editing the audio to have highlights and then transcribing it we've been able to use keywords to make it searchable the audio searchable by keyword so you can put in when you say wiki ej is that part of the tape project or is that part of another project it's, this is, it's called West Yorkshire Queer Stories. The website's fantastic because- Maybe show us quickly the website. Yeah, I can actually. I can I mean, if we need to finish in five minutes or more, but I think it would be fascinating to see the website, also the Tate website, not least because I think if people see a website and also how easy and accessible it is to use it, I think they're much more likely to come back. All right, let me just uh, find it for you. Walk through British art and okay. So I'm going to screen share now with you. Okay, I'll make that full screen. Can you see that one? I can, perfect. Thank you. Yeah. So this is West Yorkshire Queer Stories, and you see that it's got the tabs along here. It changes every time you bring it up on the screen, and it's dynamic. But if you go to see all stories, you can see these are all the oral histories and people's contributions. And then when you go in, and they just go on and on because there's a couple of hundred of them. Wow. Um, and then you can see here what's interesting about it, I think, what we've done, is you can look up now by 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 keyword. You could search by age. You could search by by sexuality, by community, by disability. You can search by location across the region. So if you're from Leeds, you might might want to listen to the Leeds stories, right? If you're from Leeds in the 1980s, you might want to listen to the Leeds 1980s stories. And if you're a lesbian, you might might want to lead the Leeds 1980s stories about lesbians, right? And so that means that it becomes penetrable, right? Yes. It means that you can find your way through audio, which traditionally you haven't been able to do with oral history collections. So it was a huge, and then it's got video, on there it's got all the films we made in response to it it's got community members that have contributed to talk about some of the objects um, loads of films that were commissioned and then we've also got a walking app that enables you to listen around leads 
to the stories in front of the location that they that they're talking about so if they say i had my first kiss in this area you can follow this trail digitally and then click on where you are and your phone will tell you you're in this area where this story happened and you can click on it and listen to the oral history grab when you're there in front of the actual place so that's i'm, I'm very proud of that one because i think we cracked quite a few different points and then we've we've also made it accessible by having all the bsl and everything transcribed so that you can so there's loads of signed bsl signed material in it um, where you actually have the the um signer doing the oral history for you and oh, then incredible. Yeah. Is that, this is the result of a huge amount of work clearly a huge amount of work a two-year project with two full-time staff and a project director um, and it was funded by uh national heritage lottery fund yes um, and it's the biggest collection of queer, queer material outside yeah, london and it, and it makes the point that it's not only objects that are collected we can collect um <coughs> excuse me we can collect stories we can collect ideas um ej thank you um just completely fascinating i think the work you've done is amazing um thank it's, you it's made a profound difference thank um, you thank you um we can't hope to do much more than that in our careers, quite honestly. <laughs> That's great. Can I have a holiday now? <laughs> is this the Tate? Oh, one quick. Yeah, this is the Tate. So this is a queer walk through British art, which we've called Queer Rate Tate this year. And I tell you why we called it Queer Rate Tate, um, because when we did this one, walk's not an accessible word, right? Not everyone can walk. And so we wanted to think of a different way of labeling it. So people choose their their piece and they do a reinterpretation of it and they go through and they share and it's it's beautiful um this one from Hadley Castle I visited Hadley Castle recently with my husband of 30 years Glenn our dear friend Patrick and our cute dog Eli Hadley Castle's near South End Essex the ruins seem to have diminished only slightly in the 200 years since Constable's sketch with views as expansive as Constable's day Hadley Castle is a place for fun adventure togetherness solitude contemplation for me, the work evokes life storms, the sunshine after, the wider perspectives we often need to clear our minds, hearts and spirits. So people write with such passion. Um, I, I think it's amazing that they find themselves in pieces and really expand our ideas of how we understand our place in history. But also that's such a universal sentiment, again, which is the other way of communicating that you were saying earlier with the lipstick, which is some experiences are very specific and some are so general that we you know everyone can relate to that and that's another way in isn't it yes and i think that actually i always say that lgbtiq plus history is not for lgbtiq plus people it's for everyone because it teaches us more about the world we live in and the people we live in with it right so it's actually it, it it adds to the textiles of life and and our understanding of where we belong and who we're here with you know so it enriches everyone's experiences not just queer people's experiences you know it's it would be absurd to think that we only want to learn about things that reflect us you know surely the whole idea of of understanding the place that collections have in the world is to understanding how they enrich our knowledge of the societies that we live in that came before us and and potentially the kind of societies we want to build in the future that are more yeah yes. I think that's the most wonderful note to stop on. Um, thank you very, very, very much. Uh, not at all, Amy. Thank you for having me. Thank you.